Now at this point, I would like to remind everybody that this is sort of an open conversation. Uh, if you have any questions at any time, you can just put your hand up or speak up, and I will be happy to answer it as we're going through the presentation. You don't have to wait until the very end. If there's something you don't understand, just say, Michael, you're not making any sense, and uh, I'll do my best to answer you as best as I can. So a celestial being, um, a tenbu, is their mortal guardians and protectors of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So they are actually derivatives of Hindu spirits from nature, um, torturous spirits, and all these spirits were taken and amalgamated into the Buddhist pantheon as tenbu. Um, so figures like rakshasas or uh, yakshas that you would find in the Hindu pantheon have sort of been brought over and adopted by Buddhist um, practitioners and by the Buddhist pantheon itself. <clears throat> and Hideki-san, he mentioned um, the fact that they are mortal. I think that's a really good place to uh, sort of stress. They do fall within these six realms of existence. So you've got the celestial beings who are at the top. They are you know, the closest to Buddhahood, but not quite. Um, they do live for anywhere between a thousand to forty thousand years. Um, they are able to gain karma, they are able to lose karma. For example, if a bodhisattva gets hurt on your watch as a celestial being, um, unfortunately you're probably going to lose a lot of karma for that one. Um, so the celestial beings, the next level after that is Nindo, which is the humans, which is us. So we are one step away from celestial beings. Um, if that makes you feel better about yourself, I hope you take that away from here. Um, Ashura do, um, so Asuras, uh, they are like humans, they can, they can be both good and evil, um, but they are very, very argumentative, they like to wage war on each other. And the celestial beings actually developed as a way to combat Asuras. So you've got the good devas, the good spirits, combat the bad spirits, the ashras, the ones that are more prone to discord. Um, animals, hungry ghosts, and hellish beings uh, fill in the last three spots. And so these are considered sort of the higher good realms of existence that you would want to be in. And these three are more the bad. You would not want to be in those realms of existence. So I do realize up here I wrote there are actually ten um, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, um, self-enlightened Buddhas, and uh, um, the, the fourth one. I can't remember off the top of my head. But there are ten that fill in completely. So the first group of celestial beings that we'll discuss is the Shiten no. Um, the Shitenno um, are a group of four deities, the uh, four guardian kings. And they developed out of a group, uh, grouping of Hindu um, deities known as Lokapala and Northern Indian Buddhist um, deities known as Lokapala. And they are the protectors of the cardinal directions. They protect against north, south, east, west. And they are based in countries and continents on each cardinal point of the central mountain at the, in the cosmos of uh, the Buddhist pantheon. Um, the mountain that sits at the center in uh, Sanskrit is known as Mount Meru or Sumaru. In Japanese, it's uh, Shumisen. So Shumisen is at the, at the center of the entire Buddhist cosmos. And the role of the Shitan no is to guard this mountain from demons, um, from any sort of evil that would look to uh, displace the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and other celestial beings that call um, Sumeru home. Uh, you can see underneath their feet, there are demons. Uh, these demons are called Jaki, um, and they represent the evil forces that are trying to um, undo everything the Buddha is uh, creating within people's hearts and within their minds. And the Shitano do, su do such a good job defending, actually, 
that a couple of these jaki became subservient to the Buddha, they turned good and served the Buddha. Um, one of my favorite stories, you can find a couple of K-school carvings, um, Ryu Toki and Tentoki, which are two demons that were challenged by the Shiteno, the Shiteno subdued them, and then these demons decided, oh, in our subservience to the Buddha, we will carry the lights for him. And so if you go to, I forget which temple it is off the top of my head. The, okay, so the Sanju Sangendo. Um, you can find a couple of lanterns with demons holding up the portion where the light goes in. And that is the result, direct result of the Shitenno. Now these Shitenno, they are often placed around the central days of a temple um, where the Buddha is placed. Originally, they would have been found at the entrance or on the outer edges of the temple, but they very quickly moved to the interior of the temple and would stand around this days, also called the Shumidan. Um, the Shumidan, um, you can kind of derive from that, that is a name that comes from Shumisen, the central mountain of the Buddhist cosmos. So there are four of them. And these are their placements. So you would think when I show you this, that you would think that Komokuten is the king of the north. But it's really not. When Buddhist mandalas are hung, north is actually on the right hand side. So, Tamon Ten is the wisdom king of the north. <coughs> Jikokuten is the Wisdom King of the East. Zokoten is the Wisdom King of the South, or sorry, the um, Celestial King of the South. And Komokuten is the Celestial King of the West. And at the center is Taishakuten. Taishakuten is a derivative from Indra, um, who is a Hindu deity. But Taishakuten, you do not find many depictions of him in Japanese art. So unfortunately, <coughs> Taishakuten was eventually replaced by Tamonten as chief of these deities. So what was originally would have been a group of five deities became a group of four because Taishakuten sort of fades out. Does that make sense so far? Are there any questions? Yes. Why did Taishakuten fade out? You know? um, it, so he became more of a, there are certain versions of Tashakuten that play the role of a um, bodhisattva. Um, so you can see a Yakshi uh, sculpture and you have um, uh, Tashakuten and Bonten. And Bonten is the uh, representation of Brahma and Tashakuten from Indra. And they serve as bodhisattvas to Yakshi. Question. Yes. Um, actually, back to one of your previous slides. Okay, which one do you want? The one, actually, just a question. Why are those mortal beings protecting someone like Buddha or others who are basically mortal, right? Are they? Yeah, um, well, they are, they are trying to gain karma to be able to um, achieve enlightenment, enlightenment themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but also, uh, when the Buddha is the highest aspiration for a being, um, want to make sure that, I guess, the, the epitome of what you achieve, you would protect it at all costs. Does that make sense? They also protect the people, they also protect the um, followers of Buddhism, and uh, so it's not only above that they're protecting, but also below. I think my question is more about why do the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas need protections from them? I can see that they gain karma. Um, because they are beings of peace. Um, they, they aren't... They're not as prone to uh, use violent means to protect themselves. But when you've got a... When you've got wrathful deities and um, warlike deities um, at your disposal, it's easier to let them protect you. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, they, they do look warlike. They are wearing Chinese style armor. Um, Chinese style armor because they've came, come from China to Japan. 
and uh, the armor was never really changed over. Um, this one is actually in Lachmo's collection, uh, the Bishamon Ten. He is the Celestial King of the North, he who is always listening. So Bishamon Ten is actually very well known to have memorized all of the Buddhist teachings. He could, at memory, recite any sutra, any sermon that you would like to hear. And his role is to defend the northern country, or the northern continent of uh, the Buddhist cosmos. He is easily, um, probably the most easily recognized because of the pagoda or stupa that he carries in his hand. Um, the pagoda, it represents the treasure pagoda, the um, massive amount of wealth that he was given after thousands of years of supplication and um, Buddhist uh, adherence to Buddhist principles. He was able to accumulate a large amount of uh, wealth, and with that, he's been dispensing wealth out to those who uh, call upon his name, and also just call him, calling upon his name um, raises your potential to gain wealth yourself. And that's why Bishamon Ten is also included among the seven gods of good fortune. Now, Another thing, he might not always be carrying a pagoda, sometimes he might be carrying a stupa. And a stupa is a reliquary building, um, and the very first stupas that were built um, were ideally the place where the Buddha's remains were placed. And so one piece, so a toe, like a toe bone, or a fingernail, or a tooth of the Buddha would be placed in a stupa. And having Bishop Ten immediately um, immediately affiliated with a place where the historical Buddha would be buried um, is also a very propitious symbol. Is there a significance to which hand holds what in, in Buddhist sculpture in, in general? I mean, I noticed in these two uh, So, it, the hard rule about um, Buddhist sculpture is that there is no hard rule. Um, you can you can look for iconography and you can look for things, but it won't always be there. So sometimes you have to uh, rely on inscriptions or you have to rely on records from the temple itself to figure out which deity it is. But there will always be some sort of uh, feature that, that gives it away. Um, so for example, placement. So if you had the Buddha at the center and if you had um, to the north, you had one of these deities placed, you would probably be able to identify that as Bishop 110, um, and so on and so forth with the other cardinal points. Specifically, which hand holds what they have those against? No, there is no, there's no real significance for that. It's uh, never a hard rule which hand it's in. Um, you will always see uh, a Buddha sculptor who wants to make things complicated for us scholars and uh, just switch it up every once in a while. Any other questions before we move on? Yes? Oh, what's the significance of what's in this other hand? So this, um, this is a scepter, or it can be a spear or a halberd, and they are usually um, tools of destruction, tools of war. Um, Bishop Monten um, himself was affiliated with being the Black Warrior. Uh, he would uh, war against the Jaki, he would war against evil, and these weapons were his main tools to deal damage and uh, also to instruct as well. Which one is the older one? Pardon me? Which one is the older? Which one is older? Mm -hmm. This one is older. Um, so this one dates back to the Hakuho period, I believe, um, which is around the 6th, uh, 7th centuries. Um, and you can tell with the development of the sculptural style, this is more simple, this is a lot more detailed. And at the more detailed the sculptures get, the, um, the later the dates will be. <coughs> Most likely, that's, yes. I just wanted to stick in there to geomantic philosophy, feng shui, the, mm -hmm. the um, most horrible demons and evil come from the north, and that's why the Shemulten is usually number one, mm -hmm. because he's the strongest. Did everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. Yes? Is that also why the sort of capital cities, there's one of mountain <coughs> to the north, like the back? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So here are a couple other depictions. You can see that sometimes rather than a halberd or a spear, sometimes he carries a, a three-pronged fork, um, a, basically a trident. But here you can see the treasure pagoda, and here there's nothing at all. And again, that makes things very complicated for us. And so you really have to look at the placement of the sculpture to figure out exactly who it is. <coughs> Now, something that surprises a lot of people is that there are deities who have gotten married. Um, Bishimonten is one of the deities who got married. Um, this is Bishimonten. This is a Bishimonten triad. Bishimonten is the central deity. To his left, our right, is his wife, uh, Kichijoten. Um, Kichijoten uh, is a beautiful deity. Um, she was eventually supplanted by Benzaiten um, in uh, Buddhist or in uh, Japanese art, Japanese sculpture. To, the, to his right, to our left, is um, their son, Zenishi Doji. Um, if you can remember, a doji is an acolyte, somebody who attends to um, bodhisattvas or to uh, wisdom kings. So the three of them, you will very rarely see them together, but when you do, see Bishamon Ten, a female character, and something that looks like a young child. It's most likely a Bishamon Ten triad. triad. Mm. Family picture, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I tend to prefer the robes that they're wearing. They're a lot more colorful and elaborate, and his seems mm. to be very one-toned. Uh, for this picture, yes. The Kishoten and the Androji figure, they are made of different material. Are they made at the same time? Like, those tribes are not necessarily made at the same time, right? They're not necessarily made at the same time, no. Um, they're sometimes made at later dates and with different materials. Um, and, uh, you know, the sculptor who adds to it may decide to add painting or have paint added to or polychromed. Yes? What is the face in the face of the pedestal that Bishamon is standing on. So that would be the demon that he's standing on. Oh, okay. Yeah, so sometimes the demon isn't always a actual, like, living being's shape, but rather they're just kind of incorporated into the base that he stands on. Yes? Is there always a demon or something? Um, not always. Uh, sometimes the, uh, the demon base is lost and the sculpture is uh, continued on just as a sculpture itself. Um, but it is most common to find a demon base with the uh, Shintendo. Yes? So, um, usually you see Bishmonten, like, you know, like a two arms, one head. Yeah. There's an incarnation, the Tabatsu Bishmonten, which is like a protector of capital city, which is May arm, four headed. Okay. Um, what is the significance of that? Like, so, um, that's just a. Uh, a lot of that is sort of affiliating esoteric principles to these uh, teachings where more arms, more heads equals more power. So that, that's my, that's the very simple explanation for that. Yes? Um, 